Hello and welcome back to the Video Essay Podcast, a show featuring conversations with leading critics, scholars, filmmakers, and other creators about the craft of videographic criticism. I'm your host, Will DeGravi, and on today's show, I sit down with one of my favorite video essayists, scholar Johannes Binotto. I know it's been a while. I thank everyone for their patience. Lately, I've been releasing only one episode per month. Uh, That has been mostly due to finishing up my first semester of graduate school, so I do hope that going into the new year, now that I've gotten adjusted to life as a graduate student, that I will be able to return to releasing two episodes per month. Uh, That is my New Year's resolution, and I will try to hit it as often as possible, but if I do not, I hope folks understand, and if you notice that I haven't released an episode yet for the month or I've only released one just keep me in your thoughts as I'm probably trying to meet some deadline Before we begin today's show, I just want to share some news from the world of video essays. As I mentioned on the last show, the scholarship and sound and image workshop at Middlebury College is back. Uh, You can spend two weeks in Vermont learning how to produce videographic criticism from some of the best practitioners out there. Uh, My former professors, Christian Keithley and Jason Mattel, and also the one and only Katie Grant. Um, The three have also just published a new online book called The Videographic Essay, Practice, and Pedagogy. Uh, The website collects their previous and also includes some new writings about video essays and also includes examples of videographic exercises from the workshop. Uh, You can find links to both the workshop and the new online book at thevideoessay.com. And also the Tel Aviv International Student Film Festival is currently accepting submissions for their Thinking Images program, uh, which is dedicated exclusively to video essays and videographic works. The call for entries is now open for submissions by students, teachers, scholars, critics, and filmmakers worldwide. Uh, You don't have to be a student to submit. Uh, They're looking for works that are distinctive and that use innovative approaches to express their ideas. Uh, Work selected for the program will be screened at the Tel Aviv Cinematheque during the upcoming festival on June 21st through the 27th. Uh, And the submission deadline is January 30th. Uh, Shout out to Ariel Avasar for sending this information along. You can find more information and links at videoessay.com. And finally, I'd just like to give a shout out to a few other video essay resources that have recently been published. Uh, Kevin V. Lee hosted the Creating Insights Video Essay Symposium and links to all the talks from the symposium are now available online. Uh, There's a new project from Ian Garwood that collects his writing and audiovisual material related to his indie vinyl project about records in U.S. indie cinema from 1987 to 2018. And there is a new collection of video essays that were just published in Nexus, the European Journal of Media Studies, edited by Tracy Cox Stanton. Be sure to check out all those resources. And again, you can find links at thevideoessay.com. And now, here's our conversation with Johannes. Oh, steady, ho, ho. Hey, look, it's Ringo. Yeah. Hello, kid. And now I am so pleased to welcome onto the podcast one of my absolute favorite video essayists. And we are meeting for the first time, Johannes Binotto. Johannes, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Well, same here. I, I think I'm probably even more excited than you are. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully that'll, that'll make for a great conversation. My first question is a pretty st- straightforward one. Um, it's one I asked everyone, which is, could you just give the listeners uh, a sense of who you are, your background, and what got you interested in making videographic work? I'm working in academia. I'm, I'm working in, in uh, I, I studied uh, literature, um, English and German literature, but I always worked on, on film. And now I'm teaching uh, film studies and media studies um, in, in in Lucerne in Switzerland at a at, at a film school, and I'm also teaching English and particularly uh, American literature and culture at the University of Zurich. So that's where I'm coming from, and I also work as a film critic. Uh, mostly in the in the past, I no longer do really like these reviews of of films. I rather write now longer essays just on on the history of of of, of film. And do a lot of lectures. And, and, and stuff like that. Before you began making videographic work yourself, were there video essays that you were watching? Do you remember the first video essay uh, that you ever watched? I would just, I just want to get the, I want to trace your your origin story, as it were. <laughs> yes, and I also thought about that, and in fact, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult question. On the one hand, I, I realized that I've. 
um, in my in my writing and really um, writing is, is is in fact like my 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 main thing that I that that I do that I realize that I'm more and more uh, drawn to these very specific um, close readings of instances in in movies. Then also I I just r- realized that uh, like uh, since I since I'm since I was a child I had a a a, a knack for films that are about other films so mm. it's really difficult for me to say what was the first video essay that i saw i thought about i have a very strong impression a very early impression of how it struck me this moment in francois truffaut's fahrenheit 451 where the books are burned and when we just have these close-ups of books and that is something that is very also specific for for truffaut this idea that in his films he would like quote other artifacts and it struck me how this how moving this is because it links i mean we all have our own memories of perhaps of certain certain books we realize oh, I, I i know this particular book and it is also um, dear to me and i think that is somehow how it started and then of course i always was drawn to also to experimental work that was working with that so a very strong influence for me is like the found footage work by uh, the film the German filmmaker Matthias Müller Matthias Müller and also Christoph Girardet um, and how they um, quote and use instances of other films in order to make something new and strangely enough I never had the fantasy although being a total movie buff I never had the fantasy of doing films myself I always thought I know too m- many things about movies and I, I know so many great movies there's no need for me to do some but in my in my lectures and also in my texts it often is like that I'm working so closely with these movies and also in my lectures that I'm very specific with the clips that I use and how I comment them and I repeat them and I saw something similar in the found footage practice of something like of, of someone like Matthias then I realized oh that's actually something that I could do um, myself also because the whole technology of how to edit um, movie clips how to 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 rip DVDs and stuff uh, when that got uh, available because you have to remember I mean I'm 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 born 1977 so I'm very much a child of the of the VHS tape Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and there's also as a as a child and as a young boy I also used to photograph the TV screen because I wanted to have I it also has very much to do with like the, the 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 fantasy of owning and getting into possession of these films that I love so I mm. wanted to have these images of certain moments and that was the only way how I could imagine how to 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 get hold of that and of course eventually with the with the digital uh, media it got more and more that what what I first had to in contrast to to when I had to photograph the TV screen I realized okay now with 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 the new technology I can actually take uh, these 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 clips that I'm so fond of, and sort of that is how it evolved. I, I love everything that you're saying because it explains so much of the passion that I sense in your work. Um, and so, that, which it makes me want to just dive right into the the two video essays by you that we'll be talking about, but I don't want to go there just yet. Um, I will tease for our listeners. Uh, Johannes has recently finished a a book chapter on video essays that um, is forthcoming, um, and I've read it and it's fantastic. So definitely be on the lookout for that. But in your writing, you tie as many people have videographic criticism to cinephilia, um, and is your own and and this is a, I'm asking this question in part in response to what you just said. But is your own cinephilia? Do you view that as a is that what your video essays are in part a byproduct of, would you say? Yeah, it's in fact a difficult question. On the one hand, for sure. I mean, also my own video essays are very much about how can I get into a deeper involvement with these films that I love? How can I almost like step into these films by re-editing uh, them? I mean, it, it puts you into a similar 
position like like the directors that you're that you're that you're fascinated with but then at the same time i also realized that i only started to do video essays when i was more relaxed with also doing harm to these films because I think the also the, the, the video essay practice quoting of certain scenes, as much as it is a aspect of fascination, it is also something you're doing harm to these to these films, mm-hmm. literally. Mm-hmm. And of course that is something that, that Laura Malvi she talks about. The, this this strange combination of, of fetishization but also destruction of, of movies. So yeah, it's sort of a byproduct byproduct of, of cinephilia, but it's also a kind of like a form of distancing to that and also in my video essays i think i'm also very much concerned with all the things that happen in these films that were not intended by anyone not Mm. by the director so it's it's a there's something i hope something (laughs) anti-autorist in my (laughs) in my in my video essays Uh, kind of like that that i would always hold on to this idea that i think films also like all other works of art they're always more intelligent than the people that they make that make (laughs) That, that, that are making them. That's such a beautiful way to put it. And it reminds me of something similar that Jen Proctor and I talked about uh, two episodes ago in relation to the films of Martin Arnold, which is that in what you're saying is that you're destroying, you're appropriating the film that you're using. And I think that for me, the most effective examples are that are the essay films or the video essays that really own that destruction and and put it at the forefront and don't try to hide the appropriation. And it seems for me, that's those are some of the pieces that I find the most intellectually stimulating. And it reminds me a lot of your piece facing film, which I don't want to, I don't want to transition to just yet, but I'm, I'm just curious, what was the first video essay or, or videographic exercise, uh, that you tried yourself? Uh, how did that go? T- tell us about that. Really my first own video essay was in fact the Truffaut slash Truffaut, uh, one. No kidding. Wow. Well, okay. So before we get to that, I want to quickly go back to to Hitchcock because you've correctly identified our shared obsession with Hitchcock. Why are people drawn to him for videographic work, apart from the obvious that he's probably the greatest director ever? Uh, but it seems to me, if you were to tally up video, all the if you were to lay out all the video essays and pile them up director by director, he would probably be at least in the top five, if not first or second on the list. I wonder if you have any insight into that. Well, I think I think on the one hand is, of course, like the oeuvre is, is, is very rich and not just like in regard to that he is a master of stylistics, but what I find more and more so fascinating is, of course, also that he's a very experimental filmmaker. I mean, it's just like... F- filled with stuff that is still to still to be unpacked i think and that's mm. in fact that runs kind of counter to the to the cliche that also he himself always put out this idea of like that every aspect in this film like every single frame is has like a clear function and i think that is in fact not the case but what is so surprising is that we look at these films and we have all these close-ups of stuff that we're not quite sure what to do with it and i think that mm-hmm. is something that 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 keeps us drawn to this particular filmmaker in addition to that just because he has been the object of so so much criticism that that in itself is also you start to get into conversation not only with these films but also with all the mm-hmm. other critics and also very famous critics and i mean Truffaut is one of the examples. Uh, Godard would be another one. That that you also start to get into conversation also with those that that that, that looked at these films before you. Absolutely, I often I often get pushback from people who you know I say oh, I've written about Hitchcock to Hitchcock. They say, isn't it hard and boring to write about someone who's been picked over so many times? And I say, no, it's. It's the opposite. It's the complete opposite, as you say. And I remember listen, listening to an interview with Guillermo del Toro, another Hitchcock devotee who actually wrote a book about Hitchcock that I don't think has been translated into English. So someone someone should get on that. Uh, many years ago when he was uh, teaching in Mexico, but he, he talks about Hitchcock's accessibility um, as a filmmaker, even though you know the craft is superb. So it's deceptively simple, but it's very accessible to people. But let's let's use this as a segue to talking about Truffaut and your first video essay, which I'm shocked here that that was your first 
first video essay because it's it, it's one of my absolute favorites and holds the distinction of being the first thing I ever wrote about for filmschoolrejects.com. I don't know if you you knew that, but when I when I got an internship there, my first assignment was to just write about video essays. And that was the first semester I studied Hitchcock and Truffaut's Hitchcock was like our textbook for the course. So I was just naturally searching for things. And I just happened upon your video essay and was like, I have to write about this. So I'll, I'll throw in our usual disclaimer, which is pause our conversation and go to the video essay.com and watch Jonas's essay. It's like two minutes long. So you have literally no excuse <laughs> not to watch it. But once again, please give us the origin story behind that because it's just a brilliant insight and connection. So I, I want to hear how you, how you came upon it. Yeah, I, 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 I love to do that. And and of course, that's also one of the reasons why, why I was excited about, about about having this conversation with you, because I always had the impression that that you, apart from my from my um, oldest brother, that you were the only one that really got this video essay. <laughs> I came across this particular instance on a TV show um, when he talks about the definitive edition of the Truffaut uh, Hitchcock book. He was invited to this TV panel to talk about that and there's an instance when the the, the moderator quoted from the book and we have just a, a short shot on Truffaut and I realized that he's moving his lips and that he's mouthing his own text and to me that instance was always kind of a it really struck me and and it moved me very much also because I knew that I mean books are so important for Truffaut and he always also had this fantasy of writing a great novel himself and he never did but the Truffaut Hitchcock book is kind of like this great novel of his mm -hmm. and it struck me that I realized okay he has this this is so important to him that he he re, he literally knows his own book uh, by heart and he cannot help but reveal that and mm -hmm. it was really and and so the origin idea for the video essay really was that I that I kept showing this clip to people because I, I I thought you have to see that this is incredible this moment and then I had this idea that I thought oh I could actually just isolate this particular instance and and and, and show it but it was very much a, a drive to I wanted to show this instance um, to other people I, I love that you're saying this because that's the exact I, I, I think the first time I watched the essay I had like a, an emotional visceral response to it because I got that in the tone of the piece and those are my favorite kinds of video essays the ones that have the tone of saying here's someone who's discovered something and they're so excited to share it with other people that they went ahead and made this video essay those are my favorite kinds and that's why I have a preference for video essays not that yours is not polished because it is but I have preferences for video essays that aren't very polished that that are rough around the edges that just feel someone who someone who just taught themselves premiere or final cut pro just to get this thing out into the world and onto the internet and those are my favorite kinds of pieces and so to hear you say that it, it it just makes it even more powerful the piece and i think also what you what you say i mean i have the, the same um, attitude and in fact i also think for me personally that is a very important aspect also like the amateurish quality because mm -hmm. i also think as much as i'm of course uh, Im impressed and I, I admire the skills of really polished pieces it's something that i realize on the one hand that perhaps i'm not capable of because i'm i'm, I'm not a filmmaker i never mm -hmm. had any training in filmmaking so this is this is all done with very poor uh, technology but it's almost like on the one hand you could say well but that does not really matter because concept is so much more important but it in a way it does matter for me because it's it's all about that it's it's in fact also i mean i think it's okay also to show that you that you're working with 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 poor technology it's okay that you show that you did this um as an amateur to keep going off what we've been discussing. The other types of video essays that I like, and I'll use this as a transition a little bit to talking about facing film, is video essays that hyper-focus on one moment or even even less than a moment, like, like one or two frames and that just really dive in deep and become their own media 
object, right? An analysis of something that perhaps couldn't be a, a newspaper article or a journal article or, or even a full blog post on a website, but but through the medium of the video essay, just like film itself can be expanded and drawn apart and manipulated. And I honestly, that to me is the most appealing aspect of videographic criticism. And I noticed that Katie commented on facing film that it was what the medium of video essay was for, was things like facing film. And again, it's another two minute video essay, so everyone should go watch it right now. But let's just into that and talk a little bit about how that video essay came into being. So I I agree, although I, I also have to say, I, I really love also video essays that are able to look at complete films, to look at complete errors, to look at even like at a whole film history. And I mm. also remember in regarding what were the f- what were the first video essays that I saw that, of course, I always also was very much in love with the supercut that we had, although the, the, the term was not yet uh, used, those supercuts at the Academy Awards when they mm. um, when they had like uh, these directors, just like a compilation of clips. I always liked that so I also realized that I have yeah that I have an obsession for the minute detail and again while I see other video essayists being so yes so able in bringing together all these different instances and also being so smooth and fast and I find that fascinating I realized well but perhaps then this is not something that that I also must try to achieve. Maybe mm, I can mm. uh, go into a different direction. So I realized while others would make it faster and have more cuts, I tend to, I started thinking about, okay, how to make even less cuts, how to focus on even on an even smaller uh, section, on an even more microscopic detail. So now we're facing film. There's this instance in Stagecoach that is incredibly famous. And of course, there's good reason for it, because it's really like the moment when John Wayne is shown to us this fantastic um, close up of his face. And of course, I was familiar with that, that scene, but I was always also... Yeah, I, I was just fascinated also with with the question of of the close up, and I and I did write several pieces about the close up, and I started to uh, combine that with a fantastic uh, theory piece by Sean Epstein, the, the the director and 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 film theorist about close ups, and I just found it interesting to combine uh, the two. That it's almost like this close up in Stagecoach, the close up of the face of John Wayne, is almost like the perfect illustration of what Epstein describes in his article. But of course, it's a fun pairing, John Wayne and Sean Epstein. Also, if we keep in mind Epstein with his homosexuality, it's a very different kind of masculinity that that Epstein stands for in contrast to John Wayne. And I thought, Mm -hmm. and I, I also continuously just showed this particular instance. And the longer that I looked at this instance in the film, I also realized, well, it's not only the close up of John Wayne's face that is so fascinating here. But also because it's a tracking shot, this moment when the image is getting blurred. And I start to wonder about, okay, what can we do with that instance right before the actual close up when the camera is moving towards the face and the image gets blurred? And that this in itself is also uh, fascinating. And then I kept looking at it, it, I was already in the midst of making a video essay out of it when I started to realize that there's even more in this moment, that I started to get obsessed with just like the the, the scratch marks on the surface of film that we also see in, in this particular instance. This particular video essay really was for me a form of exploration, something that happened while I was working on this video essay. It's also something that I, that, Mm -hmm. that struck me in your discussion with with Adrian that also he talks about that that that, that he also sees the video essay not as a uh that you just fulfill with the video essay something that you have conceptually already beforehand as a written script, but really that is something of a, the video essay itself is a research tool and you'll find something of which you do not yet know beforehand what it is. Absolutely. I know the phrase Jason Mattel uses as a lab of sounds and images. Could you talk a little bit about your decision to use text on screen for the piece? Like, did you consider using 
and I guess this could apply to the Trufo too, but did you consider using voiceover at all? What was the reason behind that? Yes, I'm I'm still struggling with that, with, with using vo- voiceover, because you prefer also written text in contrast to voiceover. Although you just recently d- did a, a really beautiful <laughs> uh, one with, uh, with, with voiceover. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> so it's... Uh, I mean, one aspect of it is really that I have, I feel a bit uncomfortable with my own voice, as as many of us uh, do. But I also thought using written text forces me to be, so that it's even more reduced, that if I use text and if I use quotes, okay, to have as little text as possible, but at the same time also to give it a very, not to try to make the video essay uh, smoother and faster and catchier, but I'm interested personally i'm interested in video essays getting slower almost like there's a meditative aspect to it and also with the with the text i think although it's a very although facing film is a very short video essay i think it feels pretty long <laughs> mm. because we have just like continuously the same shot over and over again than even in slow motion and also the text inserts are reduced in a way that sometimes I also wonder if one can even make sense out of the whole sentences that are spread across several uh, shots of the video essay or if they start to become just mm. like that the words themselves become mysterious. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm making sense here. No, you're making complete sense. It just got me thinking, first of all, I do think the continuous sentence works and I hope you'll do voiceover eventually, but I do agree that I think in this particular video essay, text on screen is the most effective because I, and, and I think this is true for the Truffaut piece too, the pacing in each is so well done and the pieces they kind of build up like like at the end of the first one it's life repeats art and continues i think i might have botched that quote a little bit but something to that effect and then in facing film it's you know face of film is kind of you've built up to it and you keep zooming in to the texture of the film image and mm-hmm. that's also the reason why i i think it, it is easier if you have just like one one moment i mean your video essay uh, about my darling clementine this moment with the barber i think i really love that and it's such a strong moment and what i find fascinating what i'm still struggling with is then the question how do i move from this instance that is so strong how can i then bring into play other instances in the film and i mean you managed fantastically in that but that is something that i'm still i'm i'm, I'm still very much struggling with because it's it's almost like i've i've a feeling that if i then leave this moment that i'm obsessed with i've lost my rhythm and i've that that's really the hardest part so again the quality is also a product of my inability <laughs> <laughs> well thank you first for your kind words about my piece i i really appreciate it but both of these essays are about more than just the film that you're talking about, right? Like intertextuality plays a key role in this work, right? Whether it's true because you have Truffaut, his films, the television show, books, and then in the facing film, it's stagecoach, the story, the film image, your video essay, and Epstein, and then your own analysis are all coming into play here. I think that's a good transition to talking about the piece that you've selected for us to talk about. I, I, would you m- mind introducing it and telling us why you selected it? I selected the the documentary or essay film Das Kino und der Wind und die Fotografie, so cinema and the wind and photography by Hartmut Bitomsky from 1991. It's one of the examples of, a, of, an, of an essay film that is um, important to me Others would have been um, by Harun Faroki, which is very, very important to me. But I also wanted to, to choose something that is easily available that can actually be seen online. And Bitomsky Pato- perhaps is not as well known as Faroki's uh, films. And it's a strange piece because it's kind of like a, a reading of different scenes from documentary films. And by doing that, by showing them and talking about them, Bitomsky and his students, they try to convey a whole theory of documentary film. But at the same time, it's also not a theory in the sense of a complete theory. But the main mm-hmm. point is really that it is a, a theory in the making, that it's 
almost like we're, we're still not sure what documentary actually is. And we have these different films and I, and I have ideas about that. And there are texts that I, that I've read about them. And you have very much the feeling, I, I think in this film of being part almost like of a seminar, of a, of a mm -hmm. research or mm -hmm. really of, of being in, in, in a, in a lab of um, attending to, to a experiment in the, in the making. Yeah, the film is so much about the process of making it and the process of making films and doing research in general. And so we are, as, as you say, we are really like, like sucked into that, whether it's reading books, watching films, watching them watch films, watching films simultaneously, hearing his analysis of films. It's quite extraordinary. And so do you see this work as an influence? Yes, on, on several levels. I also just find it, again, it's something that I want people to see because I feel that it's, that it can be really inspiring also in the sense of that it doesn't need to be glossy, but that you can also mm. show the process of working with film material. You don't have to hide it. So it's really also formal aspects in this film that I'm, that I'm so in love with. The fact that he has all these different TV monitors and that he shows how he puts a VHS tape into the machine and then says, okay, we'll move the camera now to this screen here. And when he talks about a text, he will take, he will pick up the book and open the book and look into it. So something also like someone like uh, Jonas Mekas did, which I also mm -hmm. really love. It's just like, yeah, you can, you can show where this, where this is coming from. You don't have to gloss this over. You don't have to take it out because the very process of that is also a uh, revealing because it it is in fact one of the arguments of this film that that it shows that documentary filmmaking and i would say every kind of filmmaking and also every kind of thinking about film is not just is is not something that takes place in a ideal situation and i mean ideal also in a philosophical sense that you just that you're aiming at ideas but that it's actually a very hands-on process that you're that you're dealing with machinery, with technology, and that the technology itself has ideas implemented in it and that you have to deal with that. And that is something that I find really fascinating. So that is something that is also very inspiring for, yeah, for what I would call video essay as a, as a parapraxis. Parapraxis is this notion by, by, by Freud, which is usually understood just in a negative sense. Parapraxis as a kind of like a, a, a mistake, um, something that, that happens by accident. And for Freud, of course, these moments of parapraxis are moments when the, the unconscious is in Encountered. And I would claim that this unconscious is also very much linked to the technology itself. Mm. These machines, they're also doing something else mm. that we intended. And I love the fact that this can be made made part of this film. So I also love the fact that, I mean, we see these clips on the TV mm. monitors um, that, that B. Tomsky uses, and the image is so glitched and, and, mm. and unclear and... And I think, but there's something, yeah, it, it makes visible that there's a history to these images, that there's a, a certain technology, that, that, the, that the technology that he watches them on VHS, what was formerly on film, that all this has left its traces on these films. Mm -hmm. And that this actually makes them even richer because there's a whole like a back history linked to these films that go beyond just the mere topic of these films. Everything you're saying is reminding me of the conversation I had with uh, Chloe Galibert in the last episode about Ross Sunderland's uh, standby for tape backup. And in that, we talked about, about the, the texture of the image, which is which is what you're talking about. And, but what I was thinking about as I watched this film, which I, I enjoyed tremendously, I'm so happy you picked it. There's the uh, moment where he's stacking books in VHS tapes side by side and they're just piling them up and he's just like listen to them he's like okay i you know he's like eisenstein's biography boom boom and they're all just piling up 
And this got me thinking about a couple things. The first was it made me feel like the weight of the all of the knowledge and art that has been produced and, and that is to be consumed and in writing and creating art. And so if, if we were to understand this essay film as somewhat of a theory of documentary, even though it, it it's maybe limiting to call it that because it's really not, it's an exploration of documentary that deals with theory and presents its own ideas. Anyway, it, it's almost to say like it would almost be impossible for us to engage with everything that has ever been made as we go out to set this theory. So rather than like pretend that we know everything or pretend that we have everything under control here, we're just going to stack everything up to show you all that is there and all that is to be consumed. The second that I have, which is more related to what you're saying, is that if we are to understand the origins of film, the way that people who wrote about film, it's important to understand how they viewed the images and how they consumed it, right? So if there's a if there's a philosopher or critic who were reading who only watched films on VHS tapes, in order to understand what they're saying about the film, as you say, you have to go. You truly, in some level, have to go back and watch the VHS version because there you are going to see different things. Just yeah, I mean, I mean, the the, the second thing that you that you said that is also something that I that I found interesting in the work of of the film theorist and film historian. And Barbara Klinger, she would also make this point that, of course, we have to be aware of these different formats. And I really like that she also says those are not just different versions of the same film, but they're literally like different. They're almost like remakes. The film becomes something else. And of course, that I mean, there are several um, things linked to that that we also have to 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 start to think about. Okay, maybe we should not only archive like the best, the supposedly best version of a film, but of course, also all these other versions that we have with every individual scratch, VHS uh, recordings of films, but perhaps also these very glitchy and 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 reduced and lo-fi files that are circulating on the internet. Um, filmmaker and, and, and film theorist Tito Steyer, she wrote a, a beautiful essay on that in defense of the poor image for mm. that she says, well, mm -hmm. these images, they also show something about like work processes and, and our, our times. But then also I find it interesting the first part that you that you, that you said because I I thought the way you started that it sounds like okay this is almost like depressing to realize I'll never be able to follow up on all these references that are that are used here but one could also claim that it's in fact liberating mm. that we realize yeah there are these many illusions and it's uh, and we have to let go of this idea that we could have like a complete uh, knowledge. And that, in fact, I think is also very crucial for Bitomsky and his understanding of documentary, that he says documentary is not at all documenting what is actually there, but documentary is a construction. We are mm -hmm. witnessing how um, something is a kind of uh, a kind of truth is constructed. But he would hold on to the idea of truth or something that I would link, link it to a quote that is very important uh, to me is by the French psychoanalyst uh, Jacques Lacan in his uh, he made a piece on, on, on TV a long TV interview and he started out this interview with saying I'm always saying the truth full stop and then adds but I never say it full I never say the whole truth because the truth cannot be cannot be said completely and if you claim to say it completely it cannot be the truth and I think that is that is also something that I find crucial for video essayistic work I'm not so much interested in in video essays that claim to have that claim to be in in complete knowledge about the films that they're working on that claim mm. to explain to us what is going on in these films because that as a as a posture I find problematic and I'm much more interested in these very tentative uh, pieces that that are more about making us aware that there is more to it and that these films that they're looking at, that they're still unfinished business. I, I don't think it should it should be our aim to have this fantasy. I want to make a video essay about about this classic and this is the last video essay, <laughs> right? <laughs> but the very contrary, 
it should be that that you're inspired to make your own video essay about this particular film that you realize we could do endless readings and not definitive uh, uh, yeah. readings you've just touched on something that f for me is why I started doing this and I'll, I'll offer my own personal anecdote the first video essay I made which is online is was a comparison of Citizen Kane and Rebecca, which were two films that I watched for the first time the same semester I took Jason Mattel's videographic criticism course. And I was overwhelmed by them. And I was like, I want to engage with these in some ways. But I was like, what in the what new thing? What could I write about Citizen Kane that hasn't already be, been written 10 times. And then I found this video essay by Rob Stone called Trespassing, where it juxtaposed the beginnings and endings of the two films. And I thought to myself, huh, like, what if I trespass? And the whole assignment that Jason Mattel constructed was make a video essay responding to someone else's. And I think that is the core of, of what we're doing here. Video essays are meant to exist online and be part of a conversation. And that's something that I appreciate so much about this film and your work as well, is that it's taking films that end and continuing that conversation. And I think on that note, that would be a good place to, to end our conversation. Giannis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much again to Ioannis for a truly wonderful and thoughtful conversation. On the next episode of the podcast, I will sit down with the one and only Charlie Shackleton to discuss his work, including his video essay, Criticism in the Age of TikTok. And we will also talk about Zia Anger's My First Film, which is a live performance piece uh, that you will not be able uh, to watch ahead of time. However, on the video essay.com, you can access a trailer to the project and also an article about the piece published on Sight and Sound. Again, that's all to be found at thevideoessay.com where you can access all of your homework. Please remember to do it before the next episode, which will drop sometime after the new year begins. Thank you so much and have a great holiday season.